everyone. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. We're so excited to talk with you. Oh yeah, thank you. Thank How have you uh, been feeling? Uh, we were just uh, speaking before with uh, some members of your team about how you'd been feeling ill recently. Oh yeah, I've been ill a long time. <laughs> so it's, it's just, you know, you have, you know, some days are really, really bad. You know, then you feel decent and think that you're getting better and then it hits you all over again. It's been unbelievable since March. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. We certainly hope you feel better soon. Thank you. Thank Welcome you. to the podcast. Thanks so much for joining us today to talk. Uh, we wanted to talk to you. Uh, you sort of cut your teeth in politics in 2016. Um, you ran for uh, Senate and then again in, uh, for, Missouri, uh, for Congress in Missouri's first district in 2018 um, as a Justice Democrat. Um, we just wanted to start off by asking you, what alternative does your uh, candidacy provide uh, that is not um, for, that the incumbent representative, William Lacey Clay, uh, who's been in office for almost two decades, uh, uh, does not? Uh, a lot of things. First of all, I would say that one is I would be a present congressperson, someone who is approachable, someone who is um, accessible. And um, because that's who I am, period. And as a registered nurse, you know, as an activist, you know, it just comes with that as, as a pastor, you know, um, even though I'm not pastoring anymore, it's that same heart. Uh, and so that's one thing. Um, uh, people feeling represented, it's like, a, it should be part of the job. And so one thing that um, we, I've been able to do, uh, you know, just in my activism, uh, is help build coalitions, and I am a part of a huge coalition of people. St. Louis has always been such a segregated um, community, and um, after Ferguson, well, during Ferguson is when everything started to change, and now we have been able to carry that on, and so I have relationship, good working relationship um, with our Latinx community, our um, Asian American Pacific Islanders community, our, um, our uh, LGBT community, community and um, our Muslim community, um, so many different groups in our community that where we weren't before, we are now. Um, and um, that's something that I want to push forward and continue to make people, help people to feel represented. Um, another thing is I don't accept corporate PAC money, not a dollar. And it's not that none has been offered. So I want to make that clear. People think that, oh, well, they're not giving you any. No, that's not the case. Um, it's that we don't accept any and we don't accept any because I'm someone who always felt that I I didn't have a voice next to these big corporations that are given the big dollars or these, you know, big time lawyers or whoever they are that can afford to, you know, to um, give thousands of dollars to a candidate. I'm someone that could barely give anything. Um, and so I want that person to feel represented. And so that's so I, there's I, I and I don't want to go in with anybody having a hold on me. Like, no, I want to be able to represent the people straight up. Um, so that's another thing. The other thing is, I'm not going to be someone, and I have never been this person, someone who just says, who will say I support something. I'm not going to just support something. I'm not going to just sign the dotted line. I'm going to go and fight for it if it's what my community needs and it's not happening. So I'll get on MSNBC. I'll get on CNN. I'll get on this talk show and this podcast. I'm getting on this and that, wherever they'll allow me to go and to talk about our community and what we need. I'm not going to throw breadcrumbs out and hope to have your loyalty. None of that. You won't see me disappear. Um, until it's time to, um, unless, you know, when somebody's running against me or if it's time to run again, I won't disappear. I'm going to still be there with the people and I'm bringing this community together. Yeah, well, yeah, thanks so much. And uh, when it comes to your community, St. Louis, Zach and I here are from Kansas City and it seems that soon St. Louis in particular has been hit really hard uh, by the pandemic, the COVID and uh, Missouri. Uh, as a nurse and a community activist, what are your feelings on the nation's response to the pandemic on a federal level, but also uh, Missouri Governor Mike Parson's decision to reopen so soon? Missouri for business and uh, particularly what's going on in St. Louis. Yeah, it's disturbing. Um, I don't believe we had the proper response from the beginning. Um, I believe that when if, okay, so there are professionals, there are experts in different fields, and I think that we need to listen to the people that, that have expertise. Um, as a registered nurse, don't ask me about how to be an accountant. Don't, you know, I'd rather the accountants handle that thing, but then I don't want the accountant, you know, doing the medical thing that I was trained for. So in the same way, I feel like that's where we missed it. You know, we didn't allow that to happen um, early on, and then we have a president who didn't, who, um, who decided, you know, who 
uh, didn't jump when he needed to jump. And so the rest of us are, um, are, living, are living through that um, mistake that he made. Um, and as a nurse, you know, we're already dealing with, um, you know, in the St. Louis area, already dealing with these huge health disparities, especially in like in my district, which which is predominantly um, a predominantly black district. Um, it is still uh, like there were issues pre-COVID, you know, and so now adding adding COVID nineteen to it, what are we seeing? Of course, we're seeing more um, more black people are you know are the ones who are burdened with this um, with this illness, and also um, who are the ones dying. So we have, we black women have the most cases, and then um, just black people. Period. But um, black men, maybe by a couple, are the ones that are dying. Um, and so, well, as a nurse, it, it it hurts my soul because we have people who have been needing health care, wanting health care, um, proper health care for so long. And then to add this, um, I think it's despicable. And I think our governor, uh, I think that um, it's, it has to be people over property and people over business and all of that. And that's not the way he's seeing things right now. Um, I'm not ignorant to the fact, though, that some areas of Missouri don't have the high numbers um, like we do. And so I can understand that. But I think that um, our governor should be somebody that governs the people. Um, and that's not what I feel like he's been doing. Um, I want to ask you about the congressional response so far. Uh, they passed the CARES Act through um, Congress and the Senate, which obviously gave everybody the $1,200 stimulus check, but it also provided you know, trillions of dollars in stimulus money to Wall Street. Um, as well as the recent proposal from the House of the HEROES Act, um, which passed unanimously, I believe, except uh, with the exception of Pramila Jayapal. Um, you mentioned earlier not being able to be sold on tough votes. I think that both of those cases, uh, m multiple people in Congress would describe them as tough votes. Could we just get some insight into your position on those bills? Would you have supported them and whether uh, you thought they were uh, good legislation? You know, so I would say that... Um the way that I look at it is I don't know that um, things would be the same. Um, you know, I, I feel like, uh, you know, I just don't know where everybody was and what everybody was doing at that time to allow things to get to where they ended up. Uh, you know, did the people need some money? Yes. Um, did businesses need some money? Yes. Did hospitals and, and healthcare systems need money? Yes. Uh, did we need more testing? Yes. But did we need $1,200? No. Um, that didn't solve anybody's problems. Um, and, you know, that here we go. Here we are throwing crumbs again um, at people. We need what had what have been what um, uh, I know um, Representative Omar has been talking, you know, what she her, her work on um, on um, making sure that people have the money to be able to pay their rent and um, and uh, and their mortgage and, you know, helping homeowners, um, helping uh, landowners. Uh, that what that work that she's doing, what Representative Talib has been doing, saying two thousand dollars a month is what we need, um, and and I think for her it's going for a year. Um, so I would have been, I would be the one supporting those and supporting that loudly. Um, I think also sometimes it, it like I. I I understand I'm not there, but I but I do understand that when you have when you have people that are advocating for something that and that um, are willing to go the extra mile for it, you know I think that that would have made a change. Um, I when we talk about the Heroes Act, um, would I have supported it? Probably so, um, because right now that that's what we have, and it's been a you know um, that's what that's what we have. The CARES Act, um, you know. Um, actually, with both of them, they're problematic because the money that's going to Wall Street and the building, you know, um, I, I honestly, you know, I feel like I would have done something different on the other side of it to where we wouldn't have gotten there to where we would have had to vote on it. Thanks. Um, well, another question that I wanted to ask you in light of the kind of the recent tragedy in Minneapolis, the murder of George Floyd. And as an organizer um, from Ferguson, uh, you, you uh, were very involved following the shooting of Michael Brown. Um, you've recently called for all congressional candidates to sign a pledge to end police violence. I just wonder if you could talk about some of the some of the things that both citizens can do to effectively speak up against police brutality and what uh, mechanisms you hope to bring through your role at a federal level so that we can stop the over policing and the criminalizing of our um, of our communities, yeah. uh, particularly our communities of color. <sighs> yeah. Um... I think that we are in a place where, uh, so first of all, I'm exhausted. 
I'm exhausted by it. Um, I am oftentimes triggered by these things that continue to happen. And I have to say that we have to get past this point of, um, you know, it's always like, okay, so what, what, you know, what are they going to do? What, what's going to be next? Is, are they going to be protests? Are they going to be this or that? People are looking to see that instead of figuring out and organizing what they can do to, so that we won't get here. Because as I was watch, as, as I've been watching the protests there, you know, I, as triggered as I am by it um, and the tear gas and all of that. Um, but as I'm watching it, I'm thinking, you know, this is happening, but then there may be somebody tomorrow. You know, we were just talking, you know, we've been talking about Breonna Taylor. We've been talking about um, Amaya Arbery, but we, but, but then here came George Floyd, you know, and so um, we have to do some other things. And I think one thing that has to happen in this country is we need our white community to stand up and do something different. There are groups, anti, um, like the Anti-Racist Collective, um, there's a group witnessing whiteness here locally. There are so many groups that are doing great work, but what we need is, because the thing is, I can't teach your child not to, to grow up racist. I, I can't do that. That's something that you have to do because in 10 or 15 years, who will we have? Will we continue to have this happening or will, or will um, our white community talk to their own children and, and across the board to say, to, to, under, to teach them what racism is and to teach them what anti-racism is. Um, and to, to, you know, we got to get out of this la la land of, I don't see color, you know, that hurts so many communities when we don't see color, I need you to see my color because I need you to see what happens to us. So I think that right now, I think that that's the place that we're in. You know, as a black community, we can say what well, we can, you know, do this all day long and, you know, and be, you know, enraged and all of that. But nothing happens if the people that, if, if so many of the people that have the power aren't willing to make a move. And I feel like right now in Congress, we need some more folks that's, that's gonna stand up for Black Lives, that'll stand up just like I stand up for our, um, our Palestinian, my Palestinian friends, you know, even though that's against a lot of folks in Congress, even the incumbent right now, you know, I, I stand up for BDS and I stand up for it because I feel like how dare you discriminate against them? How, how can I sit back and allow you to discriminate against the whole people when I'm fighting to make sure that me and my family aren't discriminated against? So um, I think that that's a place where we are right now is we is, is I would love to see a change in what's happening with our white community and, and a friend of mine, um, we were talking this morning and it's going to look more like what truth and reconciliation is coming out of the white community. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Um, another question I had uh, for you is as a justice Democrat and the original justice Democrat, actually, uh, what are your, what are your feelings on the state of the progressive left in America right now, especially following uh, the implosion of Bernie Sanders campaign, who you were a surrogate for. And now that we're uh, stuck with Joe Biden as the presumptive democratic nominee, someone who's routine, routinely been dismissive of policy proposals like Medicare for All, the Green New Deal, and who's kind of the architect of a lot of the problems that we're living with right now. Publicly just recently came out as anti-BDS, which you just mentioned. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that, um, so the one thing is, of course, um, progressives aren't a monolith, you know, just like um, other, any, any, all other groups. Um, well, most other groups, I guess. Um, we so there are so many, um, so many different, I guess, levels of progressivism, you know. And so I think that's where we fight. We we have this problem because we have some that are like purity tests you know, point blank. And then we have some that are like, as long as you believe these views, you know, um, or, or you believe the majority of the views in your area, then we'll consider you the progressive. Or if you believe one and everything else is conservative, but you know, you have that one in, a, in an area that's conservative, you're considered the progressive. Um, so I think that that's the battle oftentimes. Uh, and so with what happened with um, Bernie Sanders this time, I mean, it was, it, it was like, for me, it was like the rug was swept, you know, was, was yanked from up under me uh, because I wasn't expecting this to be able to happen again this way. Um, I'm very, dis I'm very, dis very disappointed in the people that played a part in um, bringing him down the way that, that he was brought down. And I'm, I'm totally disappointed and, and history will remember what you did. Um, you, you, are absolutely on the wrong side of history. Um, every single person that played a part in that, whether it's from wh whether you are Democrat or Republican or Libertarian or whatever you are, you played a part. Um, yeah, history um, 
history remember, will remember you. Um, but um, I think that right now what we have to do, because we do have Joe Biden as um, most likely as the presumptive nominee, um, now we have to look at what we can do to get him to um, um, start to lean our way and start to adopt um, what we're asking for, because this is the thing, you, ha you have to earn our votes. I, I won't back down from that. You have to earn our vote. It's not enough for me. Well, now nah, it's not enough for me to say, well, this person is just not Trump. Because the thing is, people laughed off. Let, let's be. Let's remember, people laughed off Trump what he was doing before he got elected. People laughed it off. You know, he was mocking disabled people. People, oh no, it, it's not a big. It, it's not a big deal. He was making all of these gaps. He was talking about um, uh, um, every every group of people of color he was talking about you know in in derogatory ways and in 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 white supremacist ways you know this with this superiority complex and nobody called him on it oh it's okay it's okay so how do we just allow somebody else to walk in and say well it's he's not that person no you know we he he has to earn our votes so i i won't i won't back away from that um just and I think that all Democrats need to look at that and call him to the carpet. That makes him a better person. Just like people won't allow me to just win the race. They want to hear what I stand for, who I am and all of that. I got to work for mine. So as president, he has to work for his. You know, he like I, I've said this before, he's not running for president of the car wash committee. You know, earn it. Yeah, I just to kind of expand on that, um, you know, Joe Biden seems to be rather dismissive and almost sort of uh, put off by any suggestion that the black community would want something more than what he's already done. I'm sure you've seen the clip from the Brexit Club where, you know, he kind of challenges Charlemagne and is like, you ain't black if you aren't already sure that, you know, you're going to fall in line and vote for me. He's referred to the black vote as his firewall throughout the campaign. I just want, wondered what, if you were, you know, in Joe Biden's ear, what would you be telling him that he needs to do differently in order to actually build connections with this community that he claims to be speaking for at all these times, but seems to really have a disconnect um, between reality and what he perceives? Yeah. Let's remember what happened with Hillary Clinton and her hot sauce in her bag. You know, we let's, you know, let's let's not so let's not so soon forget that um, if you don't actually reach the communities, if you don't, if you know, if it's not genuine, yeah, you may have your your the, uh, 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 particular part of the community that will support you. But if you won't get if you if you can't um, like uh, galvanize people to the polls, if you can't excite people to the polls, then I don't see how that thing is going to happen for you. And this is and the other thing is, is, is this. Um, you lose me when you tell me when I'm not black. You know, how dare you ever, ever, ever in your in, in, in your 80 years almost, how can you ever tell me that I'm not black when that there has not been ever one day when you stood up and had to wonder if a police officer was gonna murder you simply because they pulled you over? If you've never been if you've never been targeted in a in a mall or in a store, if you've never, if you've never lived that life, don't ever tell me that I'm not black. Um, and because of because of my own right to vote, my own right to vote for whoever I choose. Let's let's be clear about that. The right to vote is mine. I can vote for whoever I want, or I can sit it out if I choose to. That is my right. Um, and so for him to say that, that was um, absolutely way off. Um, uh, and the other thing I would whisper in his ear is the number of how many of my friends I remember going away due to that crime bill when I was younger and those that are still in prison that went to prison for um, nonviolent offenses um, that just ended up being in that cycle or they ended up staying in prison because stuff happened while they were in prison. So they lost their lives. I have friends who have been in jail since I, we were uh, 16 and 17 when they went to jail and they've been gone ever since. Um. While you've uh, certainly um, expanded your uh, platform since entering politics in, in 2016 um, through campaigning and community outreach and, and, and really building up the activist community as well as being featured in uh, Knock Down the House uh, along with um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and a few other uh, progressive insurgent candidates, um, uh, now in your second bid, still refusing corporate money as we talked about before, uh, how do you fight back against the democratic establishment and the big money that kind of fuels the machine um, in a time of social distancing when many of the uh, traditional grassroots strategies have kind of been thwarted by our need to stay socially distanced and oh, 
you know, prevent the spread of the virus. Yeah, well, I think part of it is, so initially it was difficult. Um, I had a huge problem with uh, wanting to make phone calls to ask people for, you know, like, how am I going to make these donor calls, you know, when this is hitting everyone? And it was just, it was really difficult. Um, but what I had to um, remember um, is that on the other side of this, there will be an other side of this. And who do you, who should be representing you on the other side as we try to pick up the pieces and we try to build our communities back. The other thing is we're in the position that we're in right now because things weren't in place because we have somebody who has been complacent, somebody who's flown, just, just, just kind of been up able to just glide up under the radar, not only in my district, but in so many other districts. And so in order to not be in this place again, um, it, uh, if, if a natural disaster happens, or another pandemic or something happens again, this is what we need. And so I reached out. And so I would, you know, um, I would call people and I would say the first thing, and I still do, the first thing out of my mouth after I introduce myself is, you know, in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, um, are, you con are, are you connected to the resources that you need for you and your family? Are there any resources, you know, that you're lacking and can I connect you? Uh, so that's the first thing that I ask about. Um, and then I take the call from there. Um, also, the team immediately started. So I ended up getting sick um, 14 days to the day after um, Bernie Sanders had his St. Louis rally here. And I introduced him 14 days to the day later. I ended up uh, sick. And um, and I like I said, I've been sick since March 24th. Um, and so my team ended up, uh, they started calling around the district. They started calling our elders first, just checking in. They were just the wellness checks only. Um, and so that's one way that we've also been able to um, stay connected and to help people to know that we're still here. Um, once people are back on their feet, you know, they may remember, oh, Corey, that one, that's the one that called me. So then maybe they'll feel like, okay, this is somebody that I can donate to. Um, I will also say the people that are able to donate have been donating and they've been saying that people have been saying that I'm going to donate because I'm uh, uh, extra because I can and I know somebody else can. Yeah. Well, that's great that uh, you've been reaching out that way and uh, helping your community. Is, is there any where people can go to support you further or to donate? Absolutely. At CoreyBush.org. It's C-O-R-I-B-U-S-H.org forward slash donate. Or you can just go to the website and just there's a donate button there. Uh, and uh, um, I'm the good Bush, so um, don't get thrown off by the last name. Thank you so much for taking the time. And, and thank you so much again for all the work you do. We were so happy to have you today. Thanks. Thank you. Have a good I really one. I appreciate it. Have a good one. Okay.